Hi, my name is Bob Green, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So on uh, Monday the 15th of June, I was requested by Valeria Zetelepin, one of the members of the Russian Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Group, uh, to make a presentation on Wednesday afternoon, uh, that is the 17th of June. So I bashed out a quick presentation uh, that I felt might be interesting to them on the... Uh, 16th and I presented it on the 17th and the following morning I had a email in my inbox from one Alexander Parkamov who had been party to the group uh, that was watching the presentation and uh, he had responded to something that I had uh, suggested and the presentation was called are we witnessing something strange or is it just manifestations of a collection of the same basic things and towards the end of that, I gave a suggestion for a test that could be conducted to look for these strange things. And I suggested that uh, the evidence, uh, or some of the evidence that I, I would use to justify the test, uh, were these particular experiments um, from Thermocore Rossi, where Chilani had observed uh, an unusual effect. Uh, the MFMP Chilani cell in 2013, something that Zatalepin and Baranov had told me uh, in Sochi and uh, something that Desireless had said in the same week of the presentation. And so I talked through those particular cases and then I made a proposal for an uh, experiment. Anyway, the paper that was sent to me by uh, Alexander Parkamov was this one. And in fact, it was from work that was conducted between 2011 and 2012. And I put some notes on this and I'll include this PDF uh, in the description of the video for you to look at, including my notes. But essentially, they were looking at potential radiation effects uh, from loading nickel beryllium and lanthanum nickel 5 uh, with hydrogen isotopes. So I'm just going to read through the key points in this uh, that I think are relevant to uh, the presentation that I gave and uh, to uh, the reasons for um, uh, the proposed experiment that people could do that I listed in the uh, presentation that I gave to the Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Group. The link to that video will be in the description of this video. Anyway, the abstract of this paper is the installation permitting uh, to investigate gamma, X-ray and neutron radiations emitted by metals loaded with protium deuterium mixture at temperatures up to 750 degrees C and pressure up to 100 bars is created. It was discovered that lanthanum nickel 5 powder, nickel and beryllium are uh, radiated presumably X-rays and neutrons. Radiation emission occurs in the form of short bursts or series of bursts lasting up to sev several tens minutes. Now, um, there's not such great translation in this, but anyway, uh, we will go through it. So effectively, it was a protium uh, deuterium mix. And as we know uh, from what we learned from uh, Francesco Piantelli in 2015, you can never get uh, pure uh, deuterium. You always have some protium in there. Uh, but you can get pure protium because you can use a palladium filter. Anyway, so... Um, in the introduction here, it is referring to the work of Piantelli and Ficardi, which is interesting, and also Andrea Rossi. So this was potentially a quick response to the original uh, presentation uh, by Andrea Rossi. Anyway, uh, it says here they chose beryllium because uh, it was a, um, a, a potential Lena material uh, uh, suitable for cold new transmutations based on uh, Yurji Bazatov's uh, Erzion model, and he was the lead author on this paper. So, um, the experimental setup, uh, where they use protium, protium uh, deuterium mixture under pressure of several tens of atmospheres and so forth. And you can read this in your own time. I'm just going to draw out what I think is relevant now. It says, a counter with a, a, a sodium iodide thallium doped scintillator 40 by 40 millimeters was used for detecting gamma radiation. In it, addition to it, four Geiger counters were involved in the experiments. Two counters had a window made of thin mica, about 10 microns thick. Such counters are able to detect X-rays and gamma rays with quanta energies as low as several kilo electron volts, beta radiation, and even alpha particles. One of them was covered with 
two millimeter thick Teflon layer. In addition, two Geiger counters with metallic walls were used, with one of them also carrying an additional two millimeter Teflon layer. These counters are able to detect gamma rays with quanta uh, uh, energy above 50 keV and beta particle energies above 0.5 MeV. For the detection of neutrons, the three helium counter located in water serving as a moderating medium is used. Such detector possesses high and approximately the same sensitivity to neutrons over a wide energy range from tenths of an EV to several uh, MeV, coupled with extremely low sensitivity to gamma radiation. So tenths of an EV uh, are kind of like um, thermal neutrons, several MeV are um, uh, <laughs> higher energy, <laughs> obviously. Um, so there's an image there, and again, it's better if you look in your own time. This is the overall setup uh, schematic, and if I zoom into this, uh, I think it's quite important. So it gives a clearer picture of what was done. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so you have four uh, metal um, Geiger counters, uh, and one set of these had uh, the two millimeter uh, of Teflon. Then you had your mica Geiger counters, and one of those had the Teflon layer in front of it. This is the moderated uh, three helium detector, and this is your uh, sodium iodide uh, thallium doped scintillator. So there's all the radiation detection that they have there. Now, investigations of thermodynamic properties of researched substances. Uh, we won't go too much into that. Uh, let's get on to the radiation figures that I think are the most interesting part here. So, um, detection of neutron radiation. The character of signals registered by the three helium neutron counter in experiments with nickel and beryllium foils. Now, in my presentation that I'd given the day previous to receiving this PDF, uh, I had referred to powders, uh, Chalani wire, uh, and um, uh, essentially those two. So this is another form. This is foils and with nickel powder. Uh, is similar, figure four. Registration of neutrons is authentic, exceeding background, and it's observed only at temperatures above 200 to 300 degrees C. Now, I've got a note here, and the reason I've got this note here is that the neutrons that we observed in glow stick 5.3 were thermal neutrons, and these were observed, um, it, it would seem that the first one was observed uh, around about the melting point of lithium, which is very close to this 200 degree figure here, 180.5 degrees C, as not uh, noticed by uh, Echo at the time, who was monitoring our experiments very closely. Um, but it's also at the temperature of the uh, sort of lower D by temperature for nickel, 176.85. Anyway, the higher uh, um, temperature at which we observed the thermal neutron uh, was uh, at about 250 degrees internal. And I have an image of that event here. So we have our one down here, which uh, uh, was one of the two there, and that's the other one. Uh, we have them here from a different viewpoint. And you can see the location here between the reactor and we had a lead-lined panel here. Uh, this is to protect thermal problems with these uh, bubble detectors uh, and also uh, to shield it, shield it from anything else and the other equipment from anything else. Um, and so there's plenty of distance there. And uh, it was uh, determined that the bubble uh, appeared uh, around 250 degrees uh, C in the core and uh, I was actually standing, basically I was taking this photo pretty much at the time, um, uh, around the time that the bubble appeared, I saw it, I saw it actually appear in there. So my, my head was as close to the detect, de to the uh, reactor as my, the uh, bubble detector was. Anyway, back to the thing here. Um, and I, I've given some links there to various uh, um, uh, things you can look at uh, with reference to this. So anyway, we observed effectively uh, our thermal neutrons in glow stick 5.3 uh, 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 um, at the same sort of temperature ranges as uh, was observed uh, by 
these experiments done by Yuzhi Bezhatov et al. in 2011 and 2012. Lanthan and nickel 5 powder, uh, it has, uh, from the counter of neutrons, has an aspect of separate short bursts appearing even at room temperature. Now, uh, I don't want to speculate too much, but I will say that if you're to believe that you can make exotic vacuum objects uh, by uh, fracto emission of electrons, uh, then that would explain it, because uh, when you understand when you load uh, hydrogen and deload hydrogen from lanthan and nickel 5, um, it ends up breaking it up and, and becoming a mesh. We actually looked, um, I think, in uh, even in 2013 or uh, so on, to maybe use lanthanum nickel-5 in experiments, pr principally as a hydrogen storage uh, medium. Um, anyway, uh, so you, you can look at this, but the, the, they all kind of output some sort of neutron signature. Uh, on figure 5, uh, the outcomes from one of the experiments of nickel powder are shown. During 60 minutes, 1,230 impulses over background are registered. It corresponds to 245,600 uh, neutrons emitted from the sample. The intensive neutron counter impulses registration happened at pressure 64 bars and temperature 250 to 350 degrees C. Now, the, the reason I... I, I you know, you, you will see Breluin talking about this temperature range where they observe uh, uh, their peak excess heat. You'll uh, uh, also potentially uh, remember, or you can see from my presentation, that uh, Desireless is reporting uh, his uh, um, signatures around these temperatures. Okay, so in figure five, it says again, intensive neutron counting, uh, counter impulses, registered, registration happened. Uh, at pressure 64 bars and temperature 200 to 350 degrees C. So you see you hit the 200 degrees here. In fact, it's a little bit higher. That's around here where it really starts to kick in, 250 degrees, and then up to 350, I guess, is up here. Uh, and so you can see uh, these neutron counts here from nickel powder. In figure six, the outcome from one of the experiments with beryllium foil is shown. Uh, during 25 minutes, 232 impulses over background are registered. It corresponds to 46,400 neutrons emitted from the sample. So it's actually uh, much lower. Uh, that's 46,000. Uh, this is 245,500. So um, the nickel is uh, doing a better job of this. Uh, I'm going to have a look at my note here. What, have I, what am I saying here? Oh, yeah, I'm just saying that 220 degrees is the highest known DBI temperature for nickel. In fact, uh, that was a key part of our uh, recipe uh, for doing uh, nickel powder experiments based on our learning from Parkamov and, and uh, Piantelli. Okay, and what am I saying here? I'm saying that it, for the case of... Um, uh, uh, beryllium, the D by temperature here for beryllium is 1166.85 degrees. So it's not not really uh, to do with that, but it may be the reaction that uh, Parkamov would not have known of uh, because we didn't uh, make that public uh, until uh, 2017, I think it was, um, with uh, the ABC story, cab, cab story, actually. Uh, where you have an interaction with vanadium-50, which may or may not be in their reactor vessel. They don't specify what type of metal it is. They do specify it's metal, but not that it could be steel. But I, it could well be steel, and if it is, um, it's quite likely to have... Um, uh, it could potentially have vanadium-50 in there, but also uh, it might have 35% uh, nickel uh, if it's steel. So uh, as they're showing that a foil will produce neutrons, uh, why not uh, nickel in the steel of the reaction vessel? Anyway, so down the bottom here, it is in one experiment with nickel powder by means of alternative activation measuring technique, we checked that the used three helium counter registered just neutrons. And they've got a figure there. From uh, 321 till 344, June the 5th, the neutron counter has registered 577 pulses over background. It corresponds to 115,000 neutrons emitted per, uh, from the sample. The radiation neutrons happened at pressure 61 bars and temperature about 350 degrees C. So here we're still seeing this around about the nickel uh, um, uh, Curie temperature. 
Uh, same kind of thing that's been observed in a good number of systems. At same time, on a distance of about 4 centimetres from the sample, the indium foil, uh, a square of 6.6 .6 centimetres uh, squared and uh, 0.35 millimetre thickness was placed. The measurement of indium activity was made by means of a thin mica window Geiger counter. The measured uh, count rate of activated indium foil in view of the decay with a half-life of 54 minutes uh, is that, and the background was that. Uh, with the counter beta particles absorption in a foil and counter window, it corresponds to an indium activity of 0.6 plus or minus uh, 0.3 becquerels. Uh, such activity would be created by neutron flux uh, 2,000 centimeter uh, in uh, -da -da -da. view of the geometry. Full the full number of radiated neutrons would be around about 400,000 plus or minus 200,000. So that would put it uh, quite closely in line. He does talk about it. Before he goes on to that, I'm just going to pull up this thing here. Um, I actually was walked through by Alexander Parkamov this technique uh, before I went to visit Roy Shinomaza for Project Omar last year. And he told me how this works. So um, I, I have a video link here which you can go and have a look at, uh, which shows how the uh, indium is used uh, uh, via neutron activation um, with uh, uh, pancake detectors uh, using that 50 something minute decay. Anyway, so he has here uh, the pulses per minute from the three helium. And then below he has uh, the uh, sort of signal from the uh, indium. Taking into account neutron spectrum uncertainty and weakness of activation effect, it is possible to recognize satisfactory fit of the two method measurements. It confirms the neutron reason of neutron counter impulses. Now, as I say again, um, this could actually be the thing that we revealed on the 3rd of August 2017, which was in fact uh, protons in, in interacting with 50 vanadium in the, um, uh, in the uh, steel of the reactor vessel. Uh, and so this may not be uh, actually coming from the fuel per se. Um, and where would you get these high energy protons? Well, I've discussed this in the past. And I have uh, this here with the Parkamov reaction table that was developed uh, by the MFMP and uh, Philip uh, Power. Um, and you can see here that if you have deuterium and nickel, the most energetic reaction produces a, a, a proton and nickel 62. And that produces 8.3657 mega electron volts. And that is shared kinetically between the two products there. Again, if you just had uh, no nickel and you were using one of the other things like beryllium or, or uh, um, uh, lanthanum, uh, you, well, the lanthanum nickel has the nickel in it. But anyway, if you have two deuter deuterons, uh, they can uh, uh, do an exchange reaction producing a proton and a triton, which we know Leonard does. Uh, uh, Tam Clayton got the award for sh showing that that occurs. And um, that produces four mega electron volts. So you will have uh, this proton coming out uh, with a share of that kinetic energy. So there is certainly the potential for producing the environment uh, if there is vanadium-50 in the steel for producing neutrons that way. Um, however, they are observing neutrons. Okay. Of course, there is a, a DD fusion uh, reaction that <laughs> yields a neutron, which you may also have in the back of your mind. So, this is where it really gets interesting for me, um, because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, bearing in mind I was making a suggestion to look for novel radiation types, uh, the rest of this thing is really quite um, uh, prescient, uh, even though it's from 2011 to 2012 work. Gamma and X-ray detector measurements. Detection of gamma radiation with photon energy with a threshold of about 50 kiloelectron volts by means of metallic Geiger counter and scintillation gamma radiometer not found any effects so it's just bad translation here but basically they didn't the the metal cased uh, guide counters uh, didn't detect uh, any 
uh, uh, gamma. The, the most productive were um, Geiger counters with thin mica window, including counters screened with Teflon. In figure 11, two series of count rate bursts of thin window Geiger counter and two series of signal from the neutron counter, which uh, were not synchronized uh, to each other's bursts, registered by the uh, Geiger counter, are visible. Two Geiger counters with metal walls not didn't receive any notable effects at this time. So... You have some kind of out of sync things here, uh, and you you have uh, in the case of the Geiger counter with nickel foil, um, you actually have when they they turn the temperature off and uh, and then uh, uh, there's a there's a pressure change like a pressure bleed. You have events on the nickel, and this is interesting because this looks a bit like was seen in uh, GS 5.3 and observed uh, in tests that were requested by ECHO and you can see this uh, and there's a link to this um, in the PDF that you can download um, but there seem to be some sort of similar observations here and there was a discussion of whether it's to do with sensitivity of the device used but anyway um, uh, the other interesting thing is that only when you've got the pressure high here and the temperature within this uh, uh, target range, you were seeing uh, the production of the neutrons. So um, uh, if you can imagine the lithium aluminium hydride is decomposing, uh, uh, we saw a, a big burst of uh, hydrogen uh, going in there. Could that be the time that the neutrons occurred? Um, certainly, if you look at the breakdown uh, sort of temperatures uh, for uh, lithium aluminium hydride, there's an argument to be made there. Uh, anyway, so I've got a link there worth comparing to the ECHO data. That is uh, the researcher ECHO. And then what they found was here, synchronous count rate bursts of two Geiger counters with thin windows, one of which was screened with Teflon thickness of two millimeters, top there. So they're both in tune with each other. Uh, the one with the slightly uh, uh, different signal uh, is the one with the, the uh, uh, Teflon. And then um, counter not covered with Teflon showed no discernible count, uh, signals over the background level. So the, whereas the so basically the the metal count um, walled Geiger counter um, didn't show any changes, but if you actually put the Teflon in front of it, you did see the changes. So this is very curious. You're actually putting something in that you would expect to potentially attenuate the signal, but actually it caused the signal to appear um, and to find its way through the metal casing. So what did the counters register? Detection of gamma radiation by means of metal Geiger counter at, uh, and the scintillation gamma radiometer with energy threshold about 50 kV did not reveal any effects as noted above. Consequently, registered radiation cannot be gamma rays with energies above 50 kV. Such radiation would have been made all, uh, would have made all of the counters uh, respond. The assumption that it was beta radiation does not hold either. Because beta particles with energies of less than 0.5 MeV, which cannot be registered by a metallic Geiger counter, also would not have been registered by counters with a Teflon layer, which is thick enough to absorb such beta particles completely. But they did show the effect. For the same reasons, any strongly ionizing radiation, like alpha particles, must be excluded from consideration. The only radiation whose properties can explain the totality of the results is the X-rays with photon energies less than 20 kV. It is almost completely absorbed by thin layers of materials with sufficiently high atomic weight, such as iron or copper, and only weakly attenuated by substances with low atomic weight, including Teflon. The walls of the metal used in our Geiger counters are made of stainless steel with a thickness of 0.1 millimeters. Such wall weakens X-rays with energies of 20 kV to more than 10 times, whereas the Teflon layer, thickness of 2 millimeter, reduces it only two times. It is clear that such radiation could hardly be registered by counters with metal walls, but can easily produce significant effects in counters with thin window 
even if they are covered with Teflon. However, analysed sample cannot be the immediate source of registered X-rays with energies of about 20 kiloelectron volts because it is located in metallic vessel with walls thick enough to cause complete absorption of this kind of radiation. So you're saying it can be explained by X-rays that are uh, of around 20 keV, but if it was X-rays of around 20 keV, then it couldn't get out of the reaction vessel in which they had the uh, nickel powder or the nickel foil or whatever. It says, it can be assumed uh, that the powder emits a kind of radiation having a relatively high penetrating power which generates X-rays outside of the vessel during interactions with Teflon or other substances. This may explain the fact that the bursts were observed in the metal counter only if it was covered with Teflon. Now, I've noted some things here which uh, should be considered. I don't know whether they're relevant, but um, uh, that they note, he notes that it's a Teflon uh, a metal container. I'm saying that the Teflon could be exciting the radiation, this uh, radiation that's able to pass through the metal uh, uh, when it interacts with it. So potentially the Teflon, it's a very famous material for gathering static, and potentially the the uh, radiation could be hitting that and... and um, uh, the static could be interacting with the radiation and maybe exciting it. Uh, or, you know, maybe, I don't know, could could there be X-rays emitted by the triboelectric effect or some interaction between the particle and so forth? Anyway, so I've given a couple of uh, videos there. Um, but one consideration is, it's not discussed here because this is before that kind of time, um, you know, this could be a string vortex soliton, uh, which is uh, Alexander Shishkin's uh, nomenclature for what I would call a black Evo that has come out of the reaction vessel uh, and then it is interacted with the Teflon producing these um, uh, 20 kV uh, um, uh, uh, x-rays. Of course, it w if it <laughs> interacts with anything, then it could potentially uh, create these uh, uh, energy uh, 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 x-rays. So that is something that uh, uh, shoulders would say that it would, uh, you know, go into a material and get excited and, and then fall apart or whatever. But anyway, uh, conclusions. I'm just going to read a couple of these. Radiation emission occurs in the form of short bursts or series of bursts lasting up to several tens of minutes. Radiation emission from uh, a nickel and beryllium are found at pressures above 50 bars and temperatures above 200 uh, degrees C. Neutron generation corresponds to half a million neutrons emitted from the sample during one hour. And uh, so that's it. So um, certainly uh, the findings here are kind of consistent uh, with potentially what we saw in uh, GS 5.0. Uh, two GS 5.3 in Chalani wires when we're reloading the cell with hydrogen. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, as a potential uh, avenue for uh, detecting strange radiation or studying strange radiation, I think that the one that I proposed to the Soviet uh, 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 Russian uh, sort of group uh, would may would be one that I would recommend more widely. Um, I, I, this is not the only evidence, these ones, uh, and this uh, new-to-me evidence from uh, Parkhamov and, and, and uh, uh, sadly departed Bajatov um, for justifying this, but it's certainly enough for pretty much anyone to consider doing this. Uh, it should be a way um, that you could uh, generate this kind of radiation and then uh, have detectors in place. And I suggest in this video also what kind of thing I would use uh, to detect it. And um, there we go. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.